Welcome to this week's episode of the Prep Athletics Podcast. I'm proud to bring you our interview with Lala Mears coach, Pat Holmes. Now, Pat grew up uh, in Indiana and went to Notre Dame, and then he became the coach after the previous two coaches at Lala Mears both went on to become D1 head coaches. Uh, Lala Mears won a Geico National High School title in 2017, and uh, he's had players go to the NBA such as Jaron Jackson Jr., Isaiah Stewart, Jordan Poole, Jeremy Sohan, and he's done the math that contracts that his players are under that have gone to Lala Mears almost hit half a billion dollars. So in this conversation, we talk about what it took to become a national powerhouse, how he schedules, how he builds his roster, some of his coaching philosophies. We also ask him what he thinks it takes to be a D1 guard and much, much more. So stick around. Enjoy our conversation with Lala Mears, Coach Pat Holmes. Thanks for joining the podcast. Welcome to the Prep Athletics Podcast. This is Corey Heights. Some battles. I'm, I'm. I'm not sure if they got us. If they did, maybe. Maybe. So you will get better as a player during that year. So it was kind of exciting. Like, oh yeah, somebody wants me. Pat, welcome to the podcast. Yeah. No. Thanks for having me, Corey. Excited to sit down and chat with you. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Uh, the big question I want to know is how La Lamere, and this is before your time, but how La Lamere goes from just being a boarding school in rural Indiana to becoming a national high school basketball champion. Like I know this is before your time, but what was the seed that was planted to get you where you are right now? Yeah, no, I think, um, you know, Michael Kennedy, who's our former head of school here um, and he's an alum. He, uh, I think he had a vision back in mid two thousands about how can we market our, our school on the national level, right? Um, Because our school is a great, it's great product, right? That not many people knew about. Um, I grew up in South Bend, Indiana, 30 minutes away um, from Lalamere uh, and didn't really know much about it. Um, and then, you know, they they said, hey, we're going to try to do this national um, boys basketball program, um, you know, and see where that kind of takes us. Uh, and Alan Huss um, was a guy who really started the program. He's now the head coach at High Point. Um, and he did a great job of identifying kids that that fit our school. Um, you know, kids that want to work hard, value an education, value the development of the whole person. Um, and then who also happen to be, you know, talented basketball players. Uh, and Alan did a great job in his four years getting it going here. Um, I think we started the program this is year, doing some mental math here, Corey, so bear with me. This is year 14 of the, the boys national program. So Alan was the head coach for four years. Um, and then Shane Ironman followed him. And Shane's now the head coach at Incarnate Word down in San Antonio, Texas. He's the guy I worked with for three years as an assistant coach. Um, and Shane took what Allen had started and just took it to another level. Um, we were lucky enough to, to win a Geico National Championship, have talented players like Jaron Jackson, Jordan Poole, Brian Bowen, Tiger Campbell. Um, and then I've been fortunate enough to be the, the coach now for the last seven years and just try not to screw it up. But uh, started with a vision of, you know, how can we help get our name out there? Uh, and it's worked, right? People know our school. Um, you know, it's, I think you see it a lot with a lot of schools throughout the country. Like you think about Butler back in the early 2000 Brad Stevens days, when those guys were making, you know, big runs in the NCAA tournament, getting final fours and championships, and they saw a spike uh, in their um, application process. Um, I think it, it kind of helped get our, our school's name out there. Um and people discover, wow, this is an unbelievable product here. Um, unbelievable school, uh, great education, great value. Um, and they're going to help my son or daughter become the best versions of themselves. So that's kind of how, uh, I guess, short answer long. That's how it kind of came to be. All right. I appreciate that. Let's dig in that a little bit more. So say you and I uh, find a school in the middle of Nebraska, and we want to do the same thing we've done at Lollamere, Right. A lot of people say they want to do this and a lot try, but they never reach the heights that Lala Mir has. So you obviously have to have an administration that's on board, right? Yep. You got to have a good coach that's got connections that can get kids to come in. But big thing is for those kids to come in, that's going to get you to the national level. The school has to get behind having aid for those kids too, right? Yeah. Yep. So there's a financial aid application for all the students that want to attend Lala Mir. So our students go through that application process as well. Um, so yeah, there is fi- a financial aid element to it. Um, but yeah, like you, you hit the nail on the head core. You got to have an administration that's committed to, to doing it right. Um, you can't be half in on anything you do, uh, whether it be athletics, you know, a science program, an arts program, 
um, and our administration, you know, had gave us full backing to go find kids that that fit us. And I think that's the biggest, the most important thing, right, is finding the kids that fit your school community um, that are going to buy in. You know, the basketball piece is just a small piece of what we do here. Um, you know, we want kids that want to, you know, excel in the classroom, excel in the community because we're a school of 200 kids. So everyone knows everyone. Right. Uh, so it's like we we want kids that want to be here for the whole Lalu experience, not just the basketball piece. Perfect. Now, walk me through, you know, 95% of the prep schools I work with are based in New England, right? And you're how far outside of Chicago? We're about 60 miles outside of Chicago. So for tra with traffic, it's about an hour, hour, hour and a half, depending on where you're trying to get to in the city. Okay. So what are the pros and cons of your location? Yeah, no, I think um, we love it. Obviously, I, I'm used to it now. Uh, you know, when you're out at our school, it's a distraction-free environment, right? We have a beautiful campus. I know you were fortunate enough to come out and check it out. Um, you know, tucked away in the woods. It kind of has a summer camp feel to it. Uh, you know, we have 200 acres of land. We got a beautiful lake on campus. Um, you know, and our, our student population is mixed in terms of uh, out of the 200 kids, we have about 120 day students um, and then 80 um, boarding students. Um, so we have, I think, 17 or 18 different countries represented in our student population this year. Uh, but it's nice to have local kids and um, our international students and domestic boarding students all kind of coming together, you know, because you get, um, you know, a good mix of um, cultures that way. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're far enough away, removed from any distractions, but also like South Bend, where Notre Dame's located, is 30 minutes down the road. New Buffalo, Michigan, which is a cool beach town, um, is about right on Lake Michigan, which is like 10 minutes down the road. Um, so there's enough for our students to do in like LaPorte, Michigan City, South Bend, New Buffalo, um, you know, on an afternoon or on a weekend. Um, and some kids do go into the city, go into Chicago. Uh, but it's also tucked away where it's a distraction free environment where our students can, you know, really learn um, to be, you know, become their own self advocate uh, and develop into the, the whole person. Yeah. And do you guys get most of your players mainly from the Midwest region or now, since you guys are such an international brand, do you get them from all over? Yeah. So for the, for the team I coach, which is the, our boys national team, um, it's a combination of both, right? We've had kids from Australia, Brazil, um, Ecuador, China, uh, Jeremy Sohan, who's great, who's from Great Britain, but he's Polish. We've had kids from Croatia, Serbia. Um, so a little mix of both. Um, and then within the United States, we've gone coast to coast. We've had kids from California. We've had kids from New York. We've had kids from Texas. Um, this year, we do have a heavy Midwest population, um, but it changes year to year, just kind of based on, um, like I said, the talent pool and, and finding kids and families that, you know, match well with our school. You just said finding kids and family. Walk me through how you build your national team roster. Are you sitting back, Pat, and and waiting for the emails to come in and then you kind of see which ones you like? Or are you being on the offensive, looking for players? Walk me through how you curate this roster, which, you know, needs to have kids that's going to buy into the school as well and buy into your culture and your system. Because I've asked this before of other coaches, like the coach at Finley Prep, Oak Hill, and I'm real curious to hear your answer. Yeah, I think we're fortunate enough because we've been doing it long enough where people, um, they know us, they know our coaching staff, they know our school, um, and they know kids that, you know, we're targeting and kids that fit well and have succeeded here. Um, so whether it be uh, college coaches, um, travel ball coaches, AAU programs, um, reaching out and saying, hey, they have a kid that's looking to, you know, possibly go to a, a boarding school situation for their junior or senior year, reaching out to us. And then, you know, we do our homework. Um, and some of it is families just reaching out via email and trying to learn more about the school. But I would say 90% of the time, um, it's someone in the basketball world, at least for our team, uh, reaching out to us um, that we have a relationship with saying, hey, there's a kid or family interested in exploring your school. Um, would you like to, you know, get the conversation going? So, um, and then in the spring and summer, our coaching staff, we're out and about uh, at all these AAU events and camps, um, watching and evaluating kids, right? So, um, you know, from the basketball piece, seeing how skilled they are, but, you know, when we're watching the games, we're also seeing how they interact with their teammates, how they interact on the bench when things aren't going well. Um, after the game, are they cleaning up the bench? How do they interact with media? Um, and then also, Crazy enough, how do their family, like how do their parents, um, you know, carry themselves and conduct themselves in the stands? Uh, it's just little things like that. That's stuff that we we pride ourselves on, um, and just try to 
do a, as best a homework as we possibly can. All right, this is going to be a PSA for people listening here, but let's say you've got two players of equal ability. One's got great parents and one's got very vocal kind of off hinged parents. I think I know the answer to this one. Which one are you going to try to attract to La Lumiere? Yeah, I, I mean, I think obviously it's a, we would go with the the one that conduct themselves the right way, right? It's just, um, you know, we want to find people that are about the right stuff, right, and conduct themselves the right way. Um, and don't get me wrong, we're all human. We're going to have those moments where we, like, I might catch somebody at a bad moment. Um, so we, we try to do it, have a larger sample size more so than just one game or, or one interaction uh, before we, we jump to conclusions. But um, yeah, I mean, that, that has, you know, made or break a couple of decisions for us um, moving forward. And I'm totally, totally fine with that. Yeah. You know, we both got young kids and uh, I, I, I know how I think I'm going to act when my yeah. daughter plays sports, but I feel like deep down inside me in, in some bowels of my, of my, my soul, there's going to be that crazy dad in there that thinks he knows better than the coach. And um, I, I hope it never comes out. I know too much, but yeah. I feel like it's in there. And I think some parent, I think every parent probably has that and some can control it better than others, but I'm just admitting to myself in front of everybody that good gosh, it's gotta be so hard to be oh. quiet during these games. And I don't know you, I might be a fine calm parent, but yeah. in a few years when they start getting on the court or on the fields, I, I don't know what's going to be trying to creep out of my mouth in, in certain moments. Yeah. I'm, I'm with you, Corey. Like, like I said, my wife and I, we have one son, he's nine months old. Um, so just learning how to crawl. But uh, you know, I say I'm going to act one way, but emotion gets the best of a lot of people. Um, like I, I even in pickup yesterday, it's like, we just want our guys playing pickup and me just sit there and watch. And there's times where I just want to like, I want to put my coach hat and go. It's like, you know what? Just sometimes you got to let kids be kids and let them figure yeah. it out um, and be there and support them and love them. And, um, you know, be a parent, uh, which is a whole lot easier said than done. Like I said, I think I had one stance when, you know, I, my wife and I didn't have a kid. And now that we have our son, it's like, okay, it, it changes things. So I can empathize with, what parents are going through when their son or daughter is going through a tough situation, right? Cause no one wants to see their kid go through that. So it's easy for me to say, Hey, you gotta let your son or daughter fight that battle. Um, but it's like, okay, I can understand where the parents are coming from as well. Yeah. Yeah. It's good perspective being a dad. Yeah. Now talk to me about La Lumiere. What was the, what was it like pre 2017 winning the national title and post 2017? Was there, a shift in perception, a shift in kids that were reaching out to you, a shift in how maybe you scheduled. Talk to me, or was there no shift at all? You yeah, know, there was definitely a little bit of shift, right? You can walk around and people know what the school is, like they or they know how to pronounce the name of the school. I should say. I mean, it's funny. My first year as an assistant, we were playing uh, playing in an event, and uh, the PA announcer before the game called us L.A. Lamar. I'm like, okay, that's <laughs> we've come a long way, right? Yeah. Um, here and people know the name uh, you know, they, they see la lu and uh they know our program they know some of our you know former former players and alumni um so it's easier when kind of having that initial conversation you know saying our school name and where we're at and um you know we have um the cachet as you can say people know who we are and um the the success we've had um both on the court and off the court with our with our students yeah, awesome. And has that helped actually enrollment too among the regular student body and getting a name out there? Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I I can't really speak on behalf of our admissions team, but I think it helps, right? Like there definitely helps with inquiries. Um, but I think our school as a whole has done a really good job growing and, um, you know, becoming just a great brand nationally um, outside of our basketball program where families, you know, they want a great independent private education for their son or daughter. Um, and we've kind of found that niche um, from a boarding school and private school in Northwest Indiana. Because like you said, you know, a lot of them are concentrated in New England. Um, there aren't a bunch in the Midwest. So we've kind of targeted that niche um, and done a really good job of capitalizing on it. Absolutely. Now, tell me this. After 2017, when you took over the program, what did you incorporate uh, in your coaching philosophy and style and culture that maybe wasn't there prior? Yeah, no, I think the, the guy I worked for, Shane Harmon, did such a great job of building um, a culture here of toughness, togetherness, um, you know, attention to detail. Um, and, you know, every coach has to be their their own person. Um, so I try to incorporate a lot of what Shane did 
Um, and we still do it today uh, in terms of early morning lifts, um, you know, where guys are, we're in the weight room at 530 lifting uh, in terms of our terminology, uh, in terms of some of the team building stuff we do. Um, and then you tweak it year in and year out. You know, I, I think I became the head coach at 26. Um, and I look back at it, it's like, man, I was pretty terrible as a head coach at 26, right? And even now at 33, it's like, man, there are some things like that was not good, right? That you, you learn and you try not to repeat. Um, but, you know, I was fortunate enough to, like I said, follow a, a, a guy in Shane who, you know, was a great mentor. He challenged me um, every single day um, to become a better, better coach, better teacher, better leader. Um, and, you know, he left the program in, in great hands to where, you know, I could just kind of continue with the, the momentum that he had, um, you know, charted for us. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it changes year in and year out, um, you know, and it also changes with how, um, you know, you, you interact with, with students, you know, back in 2017, TikTok wasn't a thing, right? Like, it's right. like okay, so it's like, okay, you're, you're never going to have to have the kids not be on social media. So it's like teaching them how to use it the right way and how to, you know, NIL wasn't a thing, right? And some of the guys we're dealing with is, okay, developing a brand. Um, so it's continuing as coaches to, to educate ourselves and, and help educate our students um, so that ready they're, they're ready when they step foot on a college campus, you know, uh, their freshman year. Yeah, love it. Now, we talked this summer, and, and uh, one conversation we had, you were doing some math on all the NBA contract uh, money that Lalumere alums were, have either made or were going to make based on what they signed. Yeah. Tell me about that and what you found out. Oh, man, I wish – I can't remember if it was a half a billion. It it's was. a lot – Right? It's almost yeah. out of a billion. That's how I remember, yeah. I remember that. So I, I couldn't remember. It was like I think it's like four ninety five. Um, but it's yeah, money that they've that they're under contract for. So we have five guys currently in the NBA: um, Jaron Jackson Jr. is with the Grizzlies, um, Jordan Poole who's now with uh, the Wizards, um, Isaiah Stewart and Jay Nivey who are both with the Detroit Pistons, and then uh, Jeremy Sohan who's with the San Antonio Spurs. So um, it's exciting. I mean, you remember? I remember working with these guys as 16, 17, 18 year olds. Um, and all of them had aspirations of playing in the NBA. So, I mean, it's, it's fun and, um, you know, gratifying to see these guys living out their dreams. Yeah, that's nuts. If, I, if I'm you, I put that everywhere, right? Because everyone wants to get to the NBA and you take coming to Lala Mir, we're at close to half a billion yeah, we, contracts. That's just we just try not to mess it up, you know? It's like, I think, uh, <laughs> I think those guys just did the opposite of what we told them to do when we were coaching and it worked out all right for them. But Pat, you do have all these high profile top 100 players. What's the biggest challenge in coaching guys with this stature? I, we really don't run into a bunch of challenges. I think the big thing is just um, getting everyone on the same page, right? Playing together, helping them understand, um, you know, we're all teachers and educators, you know, other ways to impact the game other than scoring, right? Because all these guys are coming from a high school situation where they were quote unquote the man. Um but when it comes down to like recruiting, like we, we try to, like I said, identify kids that fit us, right? So where there's little to no ego, um, where they want to be coached, they want to be told the truth, they want to be held to a, you know, a high standard. Um, and that eliminates a lot, of, a lot of issues during the season when things aren't going well. Um, but I think for us is just helping kids build that, that mental toughness and mental fortitude and grit, um, you know, to overcome tough times and be able to persevere during those tough times. Um, but like I said, with the guys we have this year and the guys we've had in the past, um, you know, asking a kid to leave home as a junior or senior in high school, like they're, they're committed to chasing something bigger than themselves. They're committed to the process of getting ready um, because if they weren't serious enough about it, they wouldn't leave the comfort of home. Um, so we, there are definitely battles to be fought, but, the most challenging one, I said initially, is just the homesickness piece. Um, and once we kind of get through those first two weeks and we're going with our workouts, these guys, they they remember why they're here, what they're working towards, um, and they they remember their why. Um, so I think it, it's easier for them to wake up every morning asking them, like figuring out why they're waking up to lift at 530, you know, when they could be at home with mom, dad, and siblings. And what's your strategy for combating homesickness? No, our school does a great job um, of keeping our kids busy. So like the first week of school, we have a week long or in or three day orientation doing a bunch of icebreaker activities and team building activities. 
um, that the kids love, whether it be a, a, rock, a school-wide rock, paper, scissors tournament, um, but kids being kids. Um, and I love our school because, um, you know, we've had some of our teachers or former faculty um, and then the people that um, help, you know, lead our residential program programming. They've been here for 25 years uh, running the Res Life programming here at school. Um, so we have faculty members that have seen anything and everything, right? But when it comes to dealing with teenagers and adolescents um, and young adult, adulthood. So it's not just a basketball coach leading leading a school. It's There's a great community here of teachers and faculty members and staff members um, looking out for all of our students. And um, we're all working as a team, just like our students are working as a team to give them the best experience to help them um, to develop into, like I said, you know, best versions of themselves. Yeah, I appreciate you sharing that. And that's the thing I tell families too, is there's no better place uh, in the academic world to handle homesickness than a prep school. Because some have been doing it for over 200 years, right? Yeah. And I said, our school was founded in 1963 and it was a small school back then and it's obviously grown. Um, but yeah, we've, we got people trained to do this and have been doing it and they love it. And it's their, their passion is working with youth. Um, so when you got that, good things typically happen. Right. Now you mentioned earlier, uh, TikTok and NILs. Talk to me about NILs. Are you doing anything with that? Are players bringing that themselves? Are people reaching out to you? Talk to me about the new landscape, especially with players with brands such as Lollamere players. Yeah, no, NIL, uh, it's trickled down into the high school level a little bit. Um, you know, most of it at this level is apparel or merchandise. Um, you know, not a ton of cash being or money contracts being thrown around. Uh, I think a lot of the stuff that people talk about are, you know, blown out of proportion a little bit, um, but it's helping kids be better prepared when they get to college mm -hmm. about what is NIL, what does it look like? Um, and yeah, starting, you know, your brand development starts started years ago, right? And making sure, you know, you're putting all the right content out there, right? And if you're on Twitter, making sure you're not tweeting out something foolish or something that would, you know, reflect poorly on a kid. Uh, or family or school, whatever it may be. Um, so it's more so just educating our guys um, rather than, you know, there are opportunities out there. Um, there are, are there opportunities out there for the highest level of guys? For sure. Yes. Um, but those are coming from other, other sources. It's not schools generating that. Gotcha. Uh, scheduling. You being such an elite school can kind of, anyone would want to play you, I would think, that wants a challenge and wants exposure. But what is your philosophy Pat on scheduling. Yeah, no, what we've, uh, we try to replicate a college schedule as much as possible in terms of the calendar year. So our kids get here middle of August. Uh, I think this past year is August 13th and we'll start, we've done like preseason workouts and, uh, pick up and skill work the last three weeks. And our first official practice will be end of September, similar to what you see with uh, division one schools. Um, we'll practice for seven, eight weeks. And then our first game will be, um, you think here first week in November and we play about 30 to 32 regular season games from November until first week in March, um, March rolls around. Our kids go on spring break for about 10 days to two weeks, come back. And then we prepare for the Geico national tournament, which usually takes place first week in April, but scheduling wise, it it's changed a whole lot since when I first got here. Um, and a lot of that is due to the fact that we're a part of this, um, National Boys Basketball Conference called the NIBC. So us, Montbird, Oak Hill, Sunrise, IMG, Arizona Compass, Lou High, Wasatch, Legacy Early College, Brewster's now in it. Um, it's a bunch of like-minded um, schools, uh, in-person institutions um, that, you know, have great independent education, independent school education, as well as, you know, elite national boys basketball programs. Um, and, you know, that kind of came about of, out of COVID, you know, back in 2020. Uh, 2020, 2021, kind of just as scheduling partners so we can have a safe and healthy season and protect the health of our student athletes. Um, and then form into this, um, you know, official conference now at the NIBC, which has been awesome. Our kids love it. That, that gets us 12 built in games right there. Um, and then in addition to that, we, you know, we travel to events like Hoop Hall, um, Metro Classic in New Jersey, um, and then try to find home games, you know, against teams from Indiana, uh, Illinois, Ohio. Uh, and there's some other independent programs like Western Reserve Academy, 
Um, we've played them in the past, and those have been great games. Um, so we play some state association teams, independent teams, and then national teams, you know, to kind of piece it together. Yeah, and talk about home games. Like, your gym is so cool. If anyone can look online and see Lalamere's gym, it looks very unique, windows at each end. Um, and mention about the architect that that designed it. Yeah, so the architect's a guy by the name of Helmut Jan, um, world-renowned architect. Um, and, you know, he's known for working on uh, airports is one of his things. And if you kind of look at our our gym, it's like an old airplane hangar. Yeah. Um, walk in, it's sunken into the ground. It's, what, five, five rows high, holds about 900 people. Um, and the cool thing is that it was featured in an ESPN article two years ago when the whole state of Indiana um, hosted the NCAA tournament when Baylor won it. Um, they kind of did, they did a, ESPN did a feature on, you know, historic gyms in the state of Indiana and our gym was fortunate enough to be, be featured. So it's a cool gym. You know, you pull up winter time, you can see the lights, you can kind of see some activity going on in there and then you turn the corner and yeah, you got a high level basketball game being played. Uh, kind of tucked away in, in the woods of Northwest Indiana. Yeah. Love it. Love it. Now, um, with all these kids reaching out to you, there's some emails you pay attention to some you don't give the kids that are listening and their families some advice on if I am reaching out to coach Holmes at Lalamere, how should I structure an email to get your attention to at least open it? Yeah. You know what? I tried as much as possible. Me or our coaches try to read all the emails um, and watch the film um, of all these kids. Cause if someone's taking the effort to reach out to us, um, I want to make sure we, you know, reach back out to them and, you know, communicate where we're at with things. Um, I think the things that really catch our eye is make it personal rather than mm-hmm. kind of like a giant email where you're copying 40 other schools, right? Make it personal and say, you know, why you feel like our school would be um, the best interest for, for your continued development. Um, I think that kind of goes a long way. That catches our eye a little bit more rather than just a blanket email. Um, and then also communicating, you know, what you're in school, what you're looking for, um, you know, in terms of a, academic and athletic experience here at our school. Um, and then typically once we get these inquiries, we first thing we do is we pass them along to our admissions team. Um, so Mary, Cor- Mary Pickens, Mary, Mary Corzones, sorry. And um, Jay Blakely, they do a great job in our admissions office. Um, so we um, typically forward those onto our admissions office and they take it from there. So, and that's when we gauge really if the family's interested or not. Sure. Gotcha. Anything in an email besides non-personal, that you don't care for or that you kind of pass on? No, I, no, I mean, I think it's helpful just to include, like I said, if it's for basketball in our, our case, you know, highlight film helps or game film. Um, so we can get a, a good evaluation of where um, a kid may be at in their, their development. Um, and, but no, I mean, just short, concise. It doesn't need to be, you know, 500 words, but, you know, maybe one just quick paragraph of what you're looking for, where you're at. Um, and why Lalamere might be a good fit for, uh, you know, a particular student. Yeah. Simple as that. Simple yeah. as that. Here's a question I ask everyone that comes on the podcast. And I'm very curious to hear your answer since you've dealt with this a lot. What does it take for a guard to play at the D1 level? Yeah. Take care of the basketball. Um, first and foremost, right. If you turn the ball over, it's going to be tough to play at any level. Um, so that's something that we, we take great pride in is having a positive assist to turnover ratio. Um, so, and that comes down to decision-making, uh, you know, being able to be strong with the basketball, no one to pass, no one to dribble, no one to shoot. Um, and then, you know, point guard, you're, you gotta be vocal, right? That's a, a leadership role. Um, cause you're going to be in tough situations, having to get your teammates to the proper spot, making sure we have the timing on the set, um, you know, getting the huddles together when things aren't going well, you know, you're an extension of the, the coaching staff out on the court there. Um, but I would say taking care of the ball. You know, not being afraid to confront and communicate a message to your teammates that might be uncomfortable um, and being a sound decision maker Um, and just having discipline right in all facets of your life. Right. It's not just I I talked I spoke with our guys yesterday before we lifted um, because we had a couple guys trickle in two minutes late to lift Mm. um, and just talking about, you know, you can't have discipline. You can't expect to have discipline on the court when you don't have discipline in other areas of your life. So, you know, the little things that our school cares about you know, passing your room inspection, right? Making sure your floor is clean, laundry's put away, your desk is clean, your bed is made, right? We're trying to help all of our students develop lifelong habits, um, but also understand, you know, having discipline in one area of your life translates to other areas of your life. 
Yeah, so true. So true. Mm -hmm. uh, you uh, went to college at Notre Dame and you worked in the basketball program there. Yeah. Talk to me about some of the biggest key takeaways you learned from Mike Bray and how they ran yeah. things. Yeah, I think Coach Bray's biggest thing is, um, you know, with his coaching philosophy was be the coach that you would want your son or daughter to play for, right? He, he worked under um, great Morgan Wooten at the Matha, who I know you probably had some battles with when you were coaching at Gonzaga in D.C., um, but he'd, Coach he'd been, Bray, he'd been gone since then. Coaching, yeah, no, yeah, he'd been gone. Definitely a figure. Yeah, you know, you know the history. Um, yeah, yeah you, were, you guys were coaching against Mike Jones. Um, That's right. But yeah, and, 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 and Morgan's son Joe is over at O'Connell. Yeah, so. over at O'Connell, and he, Joe yeah. does a great job too. But um, you know, I think Coach Bray's just philosophy of kind of being a player's coach, right? Being a, a coach that you would want your son or daughter to play for. Um, you know, he's kind of laid back, loose, gave his players freedom. Um, but he also recruited kids that fit the Notre Dame mold, right? That valued the the education, that valued the experience. Um, you know, he wasn't going out and getting one and dones. He was building a, you know, building a program with guys that would develop during their time at at Notre Dame. So, uh, you know, you'd see that there were a lot of times where freshmen might not play a ton of minutes. By the time those guys were sophomore, junior, seniors, they were, you know, all conference selections or all American selections. Um, so just, you know, identifying kids that fit kids and families that fit you as a coach, um, but also really investing in the the player development aspect and understanding that um, it's going to take some time, you know, um, ours is a little bit different because we typically with our team, you know, we try to get kids here for two years. Um, so it's a little bit of an accelerated growth, yeah. uh, but same thing, identifying kids and families that want their sons to, to be pushed and challenged and, and held accountable, you know, not only in the court on the court, but in every other area of their life. Um, but yeah, with coach Bray, it's, you know, be you, um, but you know, in the back of your mind, you know, you want to be firm, but fair as a coach, right? Like it's, who would you want in my case, who would I want my son to play for? I want, I want him to play for somebody that's going to tell him the truth, but is also going to be firm and fair, right? Um, if he's not good enough, he's not good enough. Um, but if he is good enough, you know, um, he's going to be playing, but if he's also messing up, I want somebody to, um, you know, bring that to his attention and help him, you know, get better. Uh, that's kind of the root of it all. Perfect. And then you went from there to Florida state uh, to work with Leonard Hamilton. Talk to me about you, what you took away from that program. Yeah. I mean, coach Hamilton, uh, you know, he, he was great in terms of just taking care as was coach Bray, but coach Hamilton in terms of just taking care of all, all the guys, right. Like making sure they're taking care of business academically in the weight room on the court. Um, and being really, really invested in those guys. So if you talk to any, anyone that's played for Coach Hamilton, they know how much he cares for them as human beings, um, you know, helping out his former players with um, professional opportunities, whatever it may be. You know, he, he cares for his guys so much and loves them all um, so much. Um, and, you know, I think the, player, the players know that, you know, he cares and loves for them. And um, he's also not afraid to challenge them, you know, when he, when he picks his spots. But he's kind of like the uh, – you know, when I was there, he's like the the wise sage, right? When when coach right. speaks, everyone everyone listens um, because he, I mean, he's been the head coach at Oklahoma State, Miami, and at Florida State, and then obviously had a stint with the Wizards for a year. Um, and he's built up all those programs. You know, like Miami, he he brought that program back from the dead. You know, they they had disbanded their D one program for the years years leading up to Coach Hamilton being there, and you know, led him to Sweet 16, multiple NCAA tournaments, a couple NBA draft picks, and then Florida State. Um, you know, they they kind of had fallen on some rough times, and same thing, built him into a winner. So um, he knows what it takes to, to build programs and do it the right way. Um, similar to Coach Bright, finding kids that that fit um, his personality and, and his style of play and, you know, his philosophy and working with young adults. Love it. Man, you've worked for two great college coaches there. <laughs> I've been very lucky. Yes. All right. We're going to do some quick hitters now, Pat. All right. Who's the best player you've coached against? Best player we've coached against. Ooh. You've coached against a lot of good ones. So maybe to narrow it down, like, was there a great player that just lit you guys up? One game? Um, yeah, we've, we've had a couple RJ Barrett um, lit us up. Darius Garland lit us up for like 41. Um, we played an event when he played at Brentwood Academy in Tennessee um, and you know, great program, great coach, but we couldn't, we couldn't stop Darius. He was so shifty, get to the rim, create his own shot. Um, and then last year, Cooper flag, I think everyone knew how good he was, but we played against him in hoop ball and he, he had like 25 points on 
you know, nine of 12 shooting, just efficient, dunking everything. I think that was kind of like his coming out party. I mean, at least everyone knew who he was, but like that yeah. was the whole world on notice then. Um, but no, I mean, that's the fun thing about our levels. We've been blessed to play against and coach against really high level guys, um, which makes our players better. And us as coaches makes us better in terms of trying to game plan and how to stop a guy like that. Absolutely. Uh, what's your favorite movie of all time? Favorite movie. Oh man. Um, or a couple. Yeah, no, I, I like, I'm a comedy guy. So like, you know, I've always liked like Caddyshack and um, stuff of that nature. Um, I guess I'm a kid of the nineties. So it's like, you know, Billy Madison and happy Gilmore stuff like that. Um, but favorite movie, I guess like a movie that if it's on, you know, I'm always watching it. It would be like goodwill hunting. Um, it's just always a big fan of that one. You know, my wife and I sit down. Sometimes it takes 45 minutes for us to pick what we both want to watch in that mood. Yeah. And it's probably all the time. It's like, you know, we can always throw in Caddyshack. You know, we're yeah. not, we're not going to have a bad time reciting lines back to the screen. No, no. I mean, we kind of grew up on reciting those lines. Anytime you go out to the <laughs> golf cart, you know, acting like your golf course, acting like your Carl Spackler, you know, it's like, mm -hmm. yeah. 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 See, I, I, times. Oh yeah. Me too. We used to watch it in college and rewind it and then just watch it again. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Who does I don't know. I don't know if this generation does that with streaming. There's too many options, but like, yeah, yeah when you had like 10 DVDs in your personal home collection, uh, yeah, you'd watch stuff twice in a row. So yeah, you don't want to go to Blockbuster all the time, you know, it adds up. <laughs> all right. Uh, what are your hobbies when you're not doing the basketball thing? Um, so hang out with friends and family. Um, so I'm not like a big golfer or anything like that. I like being outside. Um, you know, we have a beautiful campus here. So yeah in a lake so i'll go fish the lake you know we got bluegill bass in there um so i just like being outside reading hanging with my family um and then where we're at you know northwest indiana southwest michigan um there are a lot of good like restaurants and um you know other kind of tour brewer tours wine tours that you can take so kind of just getting out and exploring this part of the country is always you know fun to do on a weekend yeah perfect is there anything you want to discuss that we haven't touched on pat not really. Not really, Corey. Unless you got anything else for me, man. I'm, you know, this is, a, I don't do many interviews, you know, so it's like, uh, <laughs> or many, many podcasts, I should say. So this has been fun for me. Oh, yeah. Well, I want to make sure that, you know, those that haven't heard of La Lumiere, um, the few that haven't, you know, could learn more about your program. Potential kids might want to reach out to you after hearing your pitch here. So no, this is great. And plus, you shared so much good info that families and kids can use if they want to play at a high level, if they want to be a guard. Uh, and D1, how great programs do things. So, no, I think this is very valuable to share. So thanks so much yeah. for joining. Yeah, no, anytime. Like I said, the big thing we always communicate with families is like, just find the right fit, right? Yeah. Like, you know, that that's the most important piece, right? It's a, it's a numbers game. It's also how do you feel when you interact with, you know, school staff, coaching staff, whatever it may be, admission staff at each school. Find the right fit. Um, find the spot that believes in your son or daughter um, and that, you, you know, feel like are going to challenge them and help them get to where they want to get to. So everyone wants to be in the athletic world, division one. Um, but that that's hard, right? That's very hard to attain. So um, there are a lot of great opportunities, division one, II, division two, II, division three, NAIA, whatever it may be. Um, just focus on finding the right fit and the, the people that are going to believe and challenge your, your son or daughter. Couldn't agree more. Right fit. I use that word probably 20 times a day. So, yep. or the two fit. words, I should fit. say. Yeah. Yep. Fit, fit, fit. <laughs> Pat, where can people find you on the socials and via email, et cetera? Yeah, you know what? Social media, I'm trying to think. On Twitter, might be Pat underscore Holmes. We're going to uh, put it in the show notes anyway. So okay. what's the yeah. what's the best way to get in touch with you? Or to email, follow? email, okay. email. Yep, so pholmes at Um, That's the best way to, to get a hold of me um, if you're trying to reach out and inquire about our school and our, our athletic programs here. And if people want to follow you, should they – do you post more on Twitter, Instagram? You know what? On Twitter, MySpace. Follow, yeah, on Twitter, I would follow our uh, our basketball program, Lalu Basketball, because um, okay. most of my tweeting is me retweeting our basketball account. Um, so that most of my interactions on social media are through our basketball account. So I would follow Lalu Basketball. Okay, perfect. Well, everybody, this was uh, Coach Pat Holmes at Lalu Mirror Academy. Um, if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to us on all the major podcasting platforms or go to our YouTube channel and subscribe. we got a lot of bonus content on there, and you get to see um, our pretty mugs uh, when we're doing these interviews versus just listening. And uh, go to prepathletics.com to sign up for the newsletter. And uh, any questions you guys have about the prep school world, 
always feel free to reach out to me at coreyheights at gmail.com. Pat, thanks so much for joining today. No, thanks, Corey. I appreciate it. And Lalamere School, if anyone's Googling it. So uh, not Lalamere Academy. So I apologize for correcting you there. Oh, perfect. Thank you for correcting me. Yeah. Academy, school, institute. Yes, Lalamere. All right, perfect. Yeah. Thanks so much. We'll talk to you soon, guys. Take care. All right. Thanks, Corey.